welcome to another video. One of the most frequently asked questions I see on forums and in Facebook groups is what plants can you use for dark frog vivariums? It's not very easy to answer though, since there are just so many, and by many I mean many. I have well over a hundred plant species in my collection, pretty much all of which are suitable for dark frog vivariums, and that's still far far from all species you can use. This video will focus on dark frog vivariums, but it's applicable on many other small reptiles and amphibians from a similar environment. I typically like to divide vivarium plants into six different categories. These categories aren't completely cut in stone or anything, there are many plants that are kind of in between them, but I tr try to always use something from each category in my larger projects. I'm going to be talking about each group of plants, and while I'm talking, I'm going to show a few different species from my collection and their scientific names on screen. If you want to copy paste any of the scientific names and google them, I will leave a list of all the featured plants in the description or in a pinned comment. Later in the video, I'm also going to share some general advice for planting vivariums. The first category are the small leafed plants that climb somewhat flat on a wall and serve as a good backdrop. This includes different types of ficus, marcravias, some begonias and some climbing ferns. Moss can also be used for this purpose, even though I personally don't like to use too much of it. I like to just have plain green plants for this purpose, since I usually see them more as a backdrop and not a plant that I want to stand out and catch the viewer's attention. You can put these plants on a scale based on how fast they grow, ranging from I put a ton of effort into my background and don't want the plants to cover it all, to I want my entire background to be covered in a 10cm layer of leaves within the next 6 months. If you have something like Hyrolone, you might want to use something fast growing that completely covers the background quickly, but if you have a very nice looking custom made background that you put a ton of work into, it might be a good idea to pick something that grows a bit slower, such as Marcrovias, and make sure to trim them often once they start taking off. The second category includes bromeliads of all different sorts. My favorite genus by far is Rhesia, but many of them get huge, so Neurilgillas are also a good option. Cryptanthus and Tillandsias work very well too, even though I'm personally not a huge fan of them. There's a lot of options as far as colors go. There's everything from green and neutral ones to bright pink and red ones. Most of these, aside from Cryptanthus, should be planted epiphytically, meaning on top of the hardscape or background, and they usually don't want the roots to be soaking wet all the time. Until they properly root into the background or hardscape, you can attach them with many creative methods, for example cyanoacrylate superglue, if you allow it to dry before adding animals, fishing line, zip ties, toothpicks, U-shaped stainless steel wire pieces, etc. Just make sure the animals can't get stuck anywhere. A little tip, which I don't always follow, is to have an odd number of bromeliads in each vivarium. A vivarium with 1, 3 or 5 often looks way less symmetrical than a vivarium with 2 or 4. This is only about your own taste though, the frogs won't care. Before we move on to the third category, I want to mention that the next four categories are, in my opinion, often what makes a vivarium unique, However, they are a bit more optional than the first two. Of course, the first two aren't obligatory or anything, but I personally use some bromeliads and backdrop plants in every single vivarium I make. While I usually don't use plants from all these next four categories, but rather choose to stick to maybe two or three of them, unless it's a very big vivarium. The third category, and my personal favorite of them, are aroids, a family including plants such as Philodendron, Monstera, Epipremnum, Alocasia, and Syngonium. Many of them make great vivarium plants. There are many common species that you can find pretty often in normal garden centers, such as Golden Pothos, Monstera dansoniae, Philodendron scandens, etc., as well as many rarer species. Something to be aware of is that some of them don't like being in too bright light, and it can result in pale leaves or stunted growth. I should also mention that prices for some of the rarer species became crazy high during the pandemic, but many of them are slowly but surely getting cheaper and more accessible now. If the species you're looking for is still a bit too expensive, give it a year or two and chances are it will be more affordable. There are many different looks to choose between, everything from plain green to silver splashed, velvety and variegated leaves.
The fourth category is begonias. One thing that many enjoy about begonias is that you get flowers from them quite often and easily, and many are also very easy to care for and propagate, but there are some exceptions. Most are also very fast growing, a bit too fast growing for some people, but that depends on how often you are willing to trim your vivariums. Many of them, but not all, also do fairly well on the windowsill. There are a bunch of different species that all look unique in their own way. Some have vivid colors, others are plain green but have very cool leaf shapes. The fifth category is ferns. It often feels like ferns are very underrated in vivariums, and while many do get too big too quickly, there are also many that do very well in vivariums, and they really make them feel like a lush rainforest. A little tip if you like ferns is that if you buy some kind of moss mix, such as the one from Dusk Tropics, you usually get a ton of ferns popping up from it as well. They take their sweet time to grow big though. The sixth and final category is orchids. I don't have that many of them, though I wish I had more, but epiphytic micro orchids are a very nice final touch to any dark frog vivarium. There are far too many out there to mention them all here, but at least I can show you the ones I have. In my experience, some of them can be a bit difficult, and you often have to move them around a bit in the vivarium until you find a spot where they really thrive, but when you finally get them to flower, it always feels so rewarding. These aren't really necessary, and it's usually the last thing I add in a vivarium, but it's a really nice final touch. I just want to note that I'm mainly talking about the smaller micro-orchids that you can find on vivarium-related webshops, etc., since normal Phalaenopsis orchids usually don't do too well in dark frog vivariums. While talking about orchids, I should probably also mention Yule orchids. As far as their carry goes, they are completely different from micro-orchids. These thrive better planted directly in the substrate, are super easy to care for in vivarium conditions, and actually grow quite fast. Unlike with most micro-orchids, there is more focus on the patterns and colors of on the leaves than it is on the actual flowers themselves. Those were all the categories I had listed. As I said in the beginning, nothing is cut in stone and there are many other plants that are in between them, and there are also a ton of other plants that you can use as well. Now for some general advice for planting vivariums. One thing that you can consider is what style you want on your vivarium. Do you want to go for a more natural theme with mostly green plants, or do you want a ton of vividly colored begonias and variegated aroids? Do you want to have a super lush rainforest with a ton of ferns, or a more clean layout with just bromeliads and some backdrop plants? It's always a good idea to mix it up a little bit in your vivariums, no need to stick to an extreme style or anything, but it's still something that you can consider. One of my best tips is to not overplant your vivarium in the beginning, and be patient instead. If you put a ton of plants in there so absolutely everything is covered in green from day one, it will be painful to trim quite soon. I also think it looks way better if you start with a tiny cutting and let it grow and shape itself out of the vivarium, instead of squeezing in a huge plant since it will often look strange and out of place. I'll throw up some pictures of my freshly planted vivariums versus how they looked after a while. You absolutely don't have to plant them as sparsely as me in the beginning, but I think my point has still been made. Well, I think that's going to be it for today's video. Do you agree with my categories? Do you have any other plant tips that I didn't mention? Do you not agree with anything at all? Do you have any questions or specific plants you're wondering about? Feel free to let me know in the comments. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you want to see more. You can also follow me on my Instagram, at gecko underscore geek 06, where I'm usually a bit more active than I am here. Thanks for watching.